Our lesson this morning comes from the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, starting in the 54th verse of that chapter. Hear these words. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul, Saul, approved their killing of him. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are at the beginning of the third year where we are sending lay people out to three churches, Gibsland, Oak Grove, and Jonesboro, and filling the pulpits. And they have done tremendous work, and the churches are very happy with the preachers they are sending, we are sending to them. And if you think you've got a sermon inside of you, boy, do we have an opportunity for you. Um, Lamar Oliver, a retired minister, and Becky Clark are kind of shepherding the Jonesboro Church, and Don Newell is shepherding uh, the Gibsland and Oak Grove Church, and Oak Gro- or Gibsland and Jonesboro are staying pretty stable. Oak Grove has actually started growing. We are living out our Methodist tradition and heritage, and I'm getting to participate with some of these preachers in helping them prepare a sermon, and I have to admit What I love is when they come in my office after they preached, and we ask how they do, and it was a great sermon. I had a great time, and they'll shake their head, and they say, but I don't know how you do this every week. So, yes, I appreciate the fact that somebody realizes that week after week after week after week, I stand up here in front of you, and you're going, ah, he told that story 18 months ago, and he did all this. So it's quite a challenge. And as I said, if you've got a sermon in you, we want to hear from you and give you an opportunity to preach because it is part of our Wesleyan heritage. John Wesley kept trying to preach in the Anglican churches, and they kept closing their doors and saying, you can't preach here. And finally, Wesley decided he would do something that he described as most vile. He would start preaching out in the fields. Three, five, seven, ten thousand people at a time would come out into the fields and hear Wesley preach. Now, they didn't fall asleep while he was preaching. If they didn't like what he was preaching, they would throw groceries at him. Tomatoes, cabbages, potatoes, whatever, they would just chunk stuff at poor old John. And several times they ran John off the platform or out of the high ground he was preaching on. But lay preachers are part of our tradition and heritage as Methodists. And so many of these preachers are telling such good stories about the first sermon they preached. They're preaching to people who are hungry, who are glad they're there. After the first sermon Jesus preached in his home church, they dragged him out of town to the edge of a cliff, and they were going to push him off. That's how inspired they were with the preaching of Jesus. In the text this morning... We find out that's what happened to Stephen when he preached his first sermon. He was one and done. And they drug him out of town and stoned him. We're introduced to Stephen back in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. I'm sure you remember last Sunday's scintillating sermon in the sanctuary where we did have air conditioning. It was 96 in here last Sunday morning, and now it's a balmy 72 degrees. Feels kind of good, doesn't it? 
But last week I reminded you that the Hellenists were complaining against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And I surmise that one of the things the devil does is distract the church to get us to pay attention to something other than Jesus Christ. And I think that's what the devil was doing. But the church responded in the way the church always responds to a crisis or a problem. The church has been doing the same thing for nearly 2,000 years. You know what we do when we have a crisis or a problem? We form a committee. And that's what they did. Seven members of the committee. We call them deacons. And Stephen was one of the members of that committee. But Luke goes on and tells us he describes Stephen as a man full of grace and power. And he's doing wonders and signs among the people. And the Sanhedrin get a hold of this and they decide, "Uh uh-oh, he's one of those Jesus followers. We better do something about this guy. And so Stephen, before the Sanhedrin, preaches, and he unpacks the Old Testament. He starts all the way back with Abraham. He said, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you the land that you're standing on. But Abraham died with not a foot of property. As a matter of fact, the only property Abraham had was the cave at Machpelah, and he bought that to bury Sarah, and he later was buried there. A man who was promised a land died without a land. But the Bible tells us that because Abraham was obedient, because he had faith in God, God reckoned it as righteousness to Abraham. So Stephen goes all the way back to Father Abraham. He starts at the beginning. And then he unpacks the story of how the Hebrews became slaves in Egypt and how Moses was raised up by God. Moses, who murdered a man at 40. Moses, who had spent time working for his father-in-law until he was 80. Moses, who at 80 is at the burning bush and hears the call to go down into Egypt, to go toe-to-toe with Pharaoh, telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And we know the story of Moses. God lets God frees the Hebrews from Egypt. God frees them from the potential damage the the Egyptian army was going to do to him. He parts the Red Sea, drowns the Egyptians in the Red Sea, sets the Hebrews free. The Red Sea, the Passover and the Red Sea are the salvation stories of the Jews. So he reminds them of Moses. He reminds them that God tabernacled with them, that God dwelt in a house that wherever the Hebrews were, God was there because God was leading them. And he talks about God being in a tabernacle until the time of Solomon when Solomon built a temple, but that God does not reside in the temple. God does not reside in houses made with human hands, but he resides here. So Stephen has done the meta-narrative. He's told the long story. And one of the things that has happened to preaching in the 20th century and the 21st century is we don't tell the long story because you don't have time for it. We got to get you in here, get you worship, get you out of here so you can beat the Baptist to whatever restaurant they're trying to get to before you get there. And they cheat because they start church earlier than we do. And we take Scripture and we cut it so thin We cut it into these pericopes, and we'll take a verse at a time, and we'll just slice it up, and we'll hold up this verse, and we'll exegete it, and we'll preach on it, and all you get is one verse, and with some preachers, all you get is one Greek or Hebrew words. We don't tell the big story, and that's why people go, I don't know. I don't know how Abraham and Moses and the tabernacle and the temple fit in with Jesus. Oh, God, forgive us because we haven't explained it. So Stephen preached the whole meta narrative and then he gave his altar call. Here's his altar call after preaching that benign sermon. He's just narrated what Scripture says. Here's the altar call to the Sanhedrin. You stiff necked people, 
uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels and yet you have not kept it. In other words, folks, you know this. You've studied this. You've lived this. Or at least you claim you've lived this. But as we look at your lives, where are the fruits? So what do you do with a good sermon? That was a good sermon. What do you do with a good Sunday school? That was a good Sunday school lesson. Best Sunday school lesson. Best sermon I've ever heard on Sunday morning. What do you do with it? Does it live long enough that you get in your car? Does it live long enough that on Monday morning you wake up and you say, oh, I heard something yesterday and I need to live this way? What do you do with the sermon? The Sanhedrin weren't living it. And Jesus tells a story about the same thing. He said, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And if you were good Hebrew, you would know that Luke has just told us the man was a sinner because he's feasting sumptuously every day and he shouldn't be. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick Lazarus' sores. These are not cute little puppies that you see on Facebook. These are feral pack dogs that the Jews called unclean. Lazarus just wants these unclean animals to come lick his sores and give him some relief. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died, and as Jesus is telling this story, everybody leans in because he's a rich man. And in that culture, rich men go immediately to heaven. They're rich because they're blessed by God. And if this poor man, Lazarus, is in Abraham's bosom, then the rich man's going to be way higher up. The rich man dies and was buried. No funeral, no service, no mourning. And in Hades, he was being tormented. Hades, the audience is now shocked. And that's basically what we do with this parable, the rich man or Lazarus. We make it say things it doesn't. We make it say that that rich people are bad and somehow poor people are noble. Doesn't say that. New Testament never condemns wealthy people. The New Testament never in and of itself condemns wealth. The New Testament also never says poor people are somehow blessed by being poor. So, if it's not about rich and poor, we make it about heaven and hell. Appears to be that's what's in the middle. The rich man is in Hades. He's in torment. He looks up and sees Father Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. This guy didn't do anything about. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. Ha ha. Have a heaven and hell sermon right here, but that's not what the text is about. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner received evil things, but now he's comforted here, and you're in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and those who want to cross from there to us cannot do so. Then the rich man said, Then, Father, I beg you, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they may not come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, and verses 29 and 30 and 31 are the crux of the parable. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. You hear what this rich man's doing? He's looking for a loophole through the law. 
He wants Jesus, or he wants Abraham to send somebody to warn his five brothers. And if they repent, then he can say to Father Abraham, you got to let me in too now because I didn't have what my brother had. But the gist of the story is right there. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they can be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. If they don't listen to the meta narrative, they're not going to listen to one raised from the dead. What do you do with the sermon? What do you do with the Sunday school lesson? What do you do with the new insight you glean from reading Scripture in your prayer time or your private time? What do you do? Do you learn it? Do you live it? The story of Stephen tells us three things we need to be doing. First of all, we need to know our story. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to know that for ourselves. That means first-hand knowledge, not second-hand knowledge. Second-hand knowledge is what I know. It's what your Sunday school teacher knows. You need to know it for yourself. You need to have a first-hand faith, not a second-hand faith. You need to have your own belief system, your own knowledge of Scripture, your own your own narrative of this is the story of Scripture. The second thing you need to do is learn to trust God. There Stephen is, he's being stoned, and what is he doing? He's calling on the Lord Jesus. And the cool thing about the story of Stephen being stoned is there are two things in that short passage I read that don't happen any other place in Scripture. It said that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He was not filled with the Holy Spirit. He was full up with the Holy Spirit. He had been walking with God so closely that his life was just completely God. The other thing you have in this passage that you don't have any other place in Scripture is Jesus is standing. He's standing. He's honoring Stephen as the first martyr of the church. Stephen knew the story. Stephen trusted in God. We need to know the story. We need to trust in God. And then we need to practice forgiveness. In his very last utterance, Stephen, like Jesus, who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing, Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. If we learn our story, if we trust in God, if we become loving and forgiving, the stories we tell and the narratives we share will change lives. I was texting this week with a friend of mine. He pastors a Methodist church down on I-10, and it's in the Baton Rouge area. So everything around I-10 and Baton Rouge is just growing and growing and growing and growing. You can't get any real estate down there. You can't buy any houses down there because it's just explosively growing. And I said, how's it going and he said, I may get run off from the church quickly. I said, what did you do? They love you. He said, last night he was in a Bible study, and they asked him, Pastor, what's wrong with our church? Everything around us is growing. Neighborhoods, subdivision, schools, other churches. Why aren't we growing? And I said, what did you say? He said, there are two reasons we're not growing as a church. What were those two reasons? We don't love like Jesus loves. And we're not willing to forgive. The first martyr of the church, Stephen, knew the story, he trusted God, and he was willing to forgive. That forgiveness is powerful. 
There are some people that are under the grip of guilt that need to be set free, that need to know that if you confess your sins, Jesus is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And there's some Christians that just need to let go of some stuff. God didn't call us to keep account. He didn't call us to keep lists and check marks and hashtags. He called us to love God with all we have, to love our neighbors ourselves. And he called us to forgive 70 times seven. And if the church would learn to practice the grace of forgiveness, of setting people free, our narrative becomes more powerful and more authentic. The story of Stephen is a pivotal story. Everything's about to change with the stoning of Stephen. The church will no longer be associated with Judaism. The church is becoming a part of the Gentile world, and it's at the point of Stephen's stoning that the door closes to the relationship with the Jewish people. But the story also reminds us of something else, and it's in the very last verse of the text. You're in the business of sowing seeds with your preaching. And some of you go out as lay preachers, and we want you to go, and we want you to preach. And, you know, we'll send you to Oak Grove and Gibson and Jonesboro, but there are going to be opportunities for you to preach in the blend and the refuge in the sanctuary because God needs to use your voices, and people need to hear other lay people preach the Word because it's more authentic when you do it. We need to realize that we we sow our seeds tomorrow or today as you have conversations, as you talk to family and friends. Tomorrow as you're in the business world, as you're talking to the people in the classrooms with you, the people that work with you, the clients that come to you, you are sowing seeds. You may not ever see those seeds grow up and mature, but your witness to Jesus Christ is powerful. There's a character in this story, and I said his name twice. Saul approved of their killing him. We know Saul is the Apostle Paul. And I want to believe that the Apostle Paul heard what Stephen said to the Sanhedrin, that even as he was consenting to the stoning of Stephen, his heart His heart had been awakened to the love and grace of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, he goes on after this and does some other things. It says that Saul was ravaging the church, but it's on his way to Damascus that Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus. The transformation that happened to Saul of Tarsus that allowed him to become Paul the Apostle starts with the seeds that Stephen sowed while he was preaching his first and only sermon. Would you stand and pray with me? Father, help us sow seeds of love and mercy in our world to those who are in our classrooms, to those who are in our office buildings, to those standing in line in front of us or behind us, to every contact we have and every conversation we utter. Let the seed of your word be scattered. And we pray, O God, that we would see joy and hope break out in lives around us. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.